I'm just going to stand here. It's a little more comfortable. And I didn't wear a suit today. I wore my uh, Cordova tuxedo, I call it. Uh, this business actually started in their garage about 20 years ago when I moved to Cordova. And she's now not just an international brand, but a global brand. So uh, Cordova is a very aspirational little community located in South Central Alaska. And this is an aerial view of our community. Um, to understand a little of Cordova's history and why I'm here, um, Cordova has rebuilt itself many times. It started as a very successful native village, had access to native copper that they used for implements and tools that they could trade up and down the coast. In 1907, they built the largest private railroad in the world from Cordova to the largest and uh, richest copper strike in all of history. So a 220-mile railroad up to copper. And when that mine played out in 1938, they reinvented themselves as the razor clam capital of the world. And when the 1964 Alaska earthquake raised all the ground around us eight feet and destroyed the clam beds, we reinvented ourselves as a salmon uh, fishing community that we pretty much are today, uh, with one big hiccup in 1989 with the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill disaster, which pretty much decimated our community. And during that time, we've gone from 100% renewable with hydroelectric plants to 100% diesel in the 50s, and now we're moving back towards 100% renewable. So Cordova is located in south central Alaska. Uh, there's the pan handle here, and I say Cordova is kind of where the handle meets the pan in south central. And um, this is Prince William Sound here. It was named by the English, but discovered by the Spanish, which is why Cordova and Valdez are named as they are. And I'm going to give you a little background on what we've done in the last 20 years and why I'm here and what we're looking at working on going forward. So this is just kind of a map of our local system. Uh, by the way, we're a fishing community with a big economy. We're the 13th largest seafood port in the United States, have about $100 million a year fishery for a little town of 2,300 people. Uh, that being said, most of that money leaves our community, and we live on very, very limited resources. We're not connected to a road system with the rest of Alaska, and we're not connected by electric lines to the other communities in Alaska. So we're very much a self-sufficient and localized economy. And self-sufficiency and the ability to stand alone is really the initial driver for developing renewable energy projects. A sustainability for us looks like being able to keep the lights on when there's a terrible storm, not relying on others to come in and help, but using local sources of energy to be independent. And I think that's how a lot of our consumers think, uh, by the way. So this is Power Creek Project that we built in 2002. And uh, the good news is that we're in this picture, I can tell we're 100% uh, hydroelectric at this point because we're actually spilling the excess water. And uh, so the great thing is we can be 100% renewables penetration uh, most of the time, especially in the summer when we have our big industrial loads. Uh, the bad news is, is this is excess electricity going to waste. Uh, a run-of-the-river hydro doesn't store the water for later use, so you either use it or lose it. So while we're spilling this hydroelectricity on our very small 30-mile road system, people are paying $4.25 a gallon for gasoline and using gasoline cars in pretty much an ideal environment for electric cars. Um, to talk to branding a little bit, we started a green power program. Uh, we were told by attorneys and so forth that we could not get our project certified as renewable energy, but I don't like no for an answer, so I actually went and read all the criteria for the Green E organization and the Low Impact Hydro Institute, and they made an exception for us. So we were able to sell our renewable energy certificates on the voluntary markets in the United States, and the $40,000 a year that we got from that did amazing things for us. It was a little bit of liquid cash in a, in a very uh, constrained um, economic uh, business model. And it was um, a little bit more about Cordova Electric, I guess I should explain. We're a cooperative, so we are fully integrated. The consumers that buy the power actually own the electric utility. Now, it started as a private electric utility, Cordova Power and Light, uh, but then when the railroad closed, the city took over the utility. And to kind of speak to uh, vision and life cycles and, and uh, kind of the long view instead of annual budget cycles, when the city took over the utility, they were always trying to meet that year's budget. And they were underinvesting in their plant, and they couldn't keep the lights on. So the citizens got angry, and in 1978, they went and borrowed money from the US federal government. They purchased the electric utility from the uh, municipality, and they became a cooperative. And that's when they decided, we want to have underground power lines. We want to build renewable energy projects. Uh, we want control of our own destiny. And they changed from a short view to a long view. And that's really accelerated what we've done. So. 
Uh, the great thing about the renewable energy uh, program is what we did with it. And one of the great opportunities in Alaska with our very long, dark nights uh, is our rivers freeze up and we switch to almost purely diesel generation. Uh, lighting is one of the biggest loads. So we use that renewable energy certificate uh, revenue to replace all our street lights 20% a year uh, with LEDs. And um, not only this picture I particularly like because we live in a coastal rainforest where we only get about 30 or 40 sunny days a year. And uh, you can actually see the night sky now over the LEDs because there isn't so much light pollution. But uh, that was one of the things we did with the green energy project that we had. And I say had to kind of uh, set a hook for questions later, hopefully. Uh, we rebuilt another um, hydroelectric project. This was actually the site of the 1907 project. But when we rebuilt it in the 80s, we got four, let's see, a meter of rain in three days. And the flooding destroyed the project, so we had to rebuild it. Um, and then this is in, in 2011 when we uh, de-energized our last overhead line and finished our conversion from overhead to underground lines. And now we have one of the most reliable systems in the world. Uh, that winter, we had 30 feet of snow and people were shoveling out of their second story windows, but not a single person lost power for the entire winter. Um, and my personal satisfaction with that is that I got to the utilities, the engineer, when they had converted most of it, so I got to do the hard part. And everybody knows the last 10% is the most expensive and difficult part of any enterprise. It's often what ex um, kind of differentiates excellent from good and the best from excellent. Uh, here, uh, people have mentioned, so I thought I'd better show the slide. We installed four electric vehicle charging stations, uh, free charging, another hook for a question, in front of our community center, uh, that we recently built and are now using as, our, um, as a convention center. We are the site for the Department of Energy's largest uh, grid modernization project. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here is that I'm looking uh, really for two things. Partners to help us uh, deploy the Internet of Things in a smart, gritty, uh, smart grid, smart city future on a system that's very well equipped for it and with a staff and um, the very agile and innovative people that can actually make physical devices work. Because uh, many times, until you actually try to deploy them on a system, they may work in a laboratory, but uh, until you get them out in the field and actually try to test them in a hardened environment, uh, they very often don't work. And we've gotten very good at, um, at proving technology and putting it to use in ways that most don't understand. As the mayor of a community, I have to think holistically. So we don't look at energy uh, projects and integrating those into a local grid uh, to solve energy problems. We look at it in very much the same way that Iceland does as an infrastructure investment by the community. So how can we get the highest and best value? Can a hydro project also be a community water supply? Can it offer recreational and educational opportunities to the community? Does it fit your business model and help your fishing industry grow and be sustainable? So um, we'll be installing a grid-scale battery that will help us leverage more hydroelectricity in a way that very few people are using batteries. And with that, I would encourage questions at the end. And that's my contact information. Unfortunately, I got separated from my business card, so hopefully a quick photo if you'd like to get in touch, uh, particularly to partner if you're a company or a vendor and um, would like to join us in our march towards a smart city future. Thank you. Thank you.